So the busy week for the Council Watch team continued into Thursday night when we all headed off to Needham Market to listen to the baller hat farmer Mark Byford give a talk on the state of farming. Now Mark and I were involved in the video for the People's Food and Farming Alliance so although I kind of knew him from there I hadn't actually met him so I thought I'd go and sneak in and sit at the back and then say hello to him afterwards. Hawkeye Mark looked at the names on the list and I got a text. Would you like to do a talk on Net Zero? All right then, I will. So no rest for the wicked, as they say. I must have been very wicked in my last life. I hope I enjoyed it. So potatoes wholesale are about £15 a bag. During the pandemic, they were £5 a bag. And I could ring farmers and I could access two, three, four hundred tonne in a day. Now, the food just isn't there in the system. So that's why this is going to be very different played out this time round. And I cannot emphasize enough to people, as much as I'll talk, we'll talk about the farming side later, on my thoughts of where the food side is at this point. If you have not started stocking up yet, you want to do so and you want to do so quickly. The other side is we are now coming into spring and at some point you've had that big bright thing has shown, its, shown itself twice this week now. The ground might dry out enough to get some seeds in. Have you got a garden? Have you got some beds you can grow your own stuff? You're never going to grow enough. End of. But think about this. Is there anyone in here who has three meals a day? Yeah? Fair show of hands. Three meals a day? Yeah, fair. 365 days in a year. So it's a thousand plates, you can say, of food for each person in your house. And when I say to people, have you got food supply stored up for how long? and you work it out platefuls, and then you go, well, it's for us in our house is free, that's 3,000 plates, that's a lot of food if you're trying to get it all together now, all right? So where does that end up? Because at the end of the day, we're in a position now where food prices have gone up exponentially. We all know that in the last couple of years, food prices have gone through the roof. <coughs> Why? And I just want to show you something. How much was the cauliflower? Right, £1.75. Do you know how much the farmer was paid for that? So that's what you as a customer walking in the door, you're going to Sainsbury's, that's going to cost you £1.75. Do you know how much the farmer got paid for that? Okay. Now, there's two systems, I don't know for those who know who deal with supermarkets, there's two systems. Some where the farmer only does bed and breakfast for the crop, the crop belongs to Tesco's or Sainsbury's, whoever it might be, and they pay them like a penny of cauliflower to grow it. Everyone that leaves the farm. Or they buy that off of them at 28 pence. Now, you do the maths. You know what you're paying as a consumer and the farmers are getting completely screwed the other end. Who's earning all the money? And here's the big kicker. We all support them. What the big percentage of people do, unfortunately. I don't. One pound 20. One pound 20. Litre of milk, one pound 20. This is at Sainsbury's today. On the way down, pound twenty. How much do you reckon the farmer gets? I did a report on this the other day on I was on the Richard Vogue show talking about this. So, cost of production of that is forty-two p. Right? That's what the farmers reckon it costs to produce it. Yeah. Farmer gets thirty-two p for for taking it off the farm. So they lose ten pence a litre every litre what goes in the tanker that goes up the drive to go to a supermarket, they're losing money. Then anyone will go, well, why the hell did they sign the contract? The problem is, when they signed that contract two, three years ago, cost of running the farm was down here. During the pandemic, fair to say, red diesel was what, 20 pence a litre then? Now it's going up 90 pence a pound a litre some places. So cost of running the farm has gone through the frickin' roof. Cost of electric to run the, whether that's heating the sheds or for the animals or whether that's running the corn dryers, whatever any farmer's got to do, there is always this challenge that the costs have got exponential. Like I said earlier, feed prices. When I took my farm on at Thurston, the grain for the chickens then was four pounds, I think then four pound 90 a bag, just shy of a fiver. Now, that's like 12 pound 90 a bag. Depends on what ones you buy, obviously. But that's how much it's gone up, so the cost of running the farm has just got absolutely out of control. In the background of that as well, you've also got the other side, that a lot of the farmers are being encouraged, I will say, not forced, encouraged. Coerced. Coerced, whatever <laughs> word you want to use. To, to not farm. And we're gonna, we'll cover this in the second half. One of the things which, of the three things we're gonna cover in the second half is legislation. 
and the legislation now that farmers go through because of DEFRA and the Environment Agency is mind-blowing, just mind-blowing. Legislation that wasn't there, the farming side's got really bad. So legislation is a big issue. So as a result of the legislation increase, farmers have got to the point they don't want to farm because it's not about farming anymore. It's about this massive amount of paperwork they've got to deal with. Now we have to have a certificate to say it's gone to the correct place. Mm -hmm. So if you lose a pig, so it's not going to market anymore, you're not getting paid for it, so you're down, let's say, 90 pounds, 80, 90 pounds, whatever the pig's worth, Oh no, now you've got to pay up to £100 to get it collected, right? So you've lost your pig and you've lost your £100. And it's just those little things what just got to the point where I was like running the farm going, and I was only a small farm, 12 acres. Some of these people are running big sites with lots of production and massive overheads. It just gets worse and worse. I, you know, I feel for anyone who's in the farm inside. As a result of all that, there's various under the green schemes which will cover a bit more on later. There's lots of options for farmers to get out of farming, right? So they'll come along, the government will make sure that the right person turns up. So you've got the option to farmer to sell up if you don't want to continue. And what one of the biggest challenges has been is that a lot of people my age, dads and uncles and so forth had the farms, they didn't want us to go into farming because they've dealt with all the shit they've had to deal with. As a result of that, where do you end up? So you lost a generation, lots of the farms I go to to buy veg and stuff from, it's the grandkids who are wanting to take over the farms because they're understanding where the farmer's got to go to. So you've got this transition period and, we, and Rachel and I have been working um, with um, Catherine McBean from the People's Food and Farming Alliance. We put together a video over the last few weeks which has gone out to talk about the transition in farming. So as a result of lots of the farmers getting out, and there's over 2,000 farms, so bear in mind there's 105,000 farms in the UK, over 2,000 in the past few months have already taken the money to get out of farming. So they get given a handout and they sell the farm. Mm -hmm. Okay? You've got all 2,000 farms being wiped out. You do the research, don't take any notice of me, do the research and you find out who's bought all them farms. I guarantee you two names will come to roost. I guarantee it. One's BlackRock, <laughs> Vanguard every time, right? They always say, follow the money. Yeah, they always follow the science, we know that worked out for us. But if you follow the money, it ends up with those two companies every time, what's buying up all the land. Why would you want to buy up all that land if farming is not profitable? Well, that's interesting. Have you read the Sainsbury's report? Yes. For those who haven't read it, if you go to Sainsbury's website, there's a report on there which talks about no farms by 2030. And it talks about what will be replacing what we eat. So we don't need steak because that's just cow's fart and they're terrible things for the environment. But we will be eating jellyfish, synthetic meat, crickets, cockroaches, um, aquaponically grown fruit and vegetables. Soil and green. Well, I don't know about any of you, but I ain't taking part in that. <laughs> There's no way I'm buying into that bullshit. But what are the options if you don't want to buy into it? Because if the farmers are coming out of farming, and the other thing which we'll cover a bit more in depth later, um, net zero, my favourite subject, there is loads and loads of initiatives being put into place for farmers to not produce food. To, if you far behind, a lot of people have been following what's happening with the Welsh farmers, they've basically been told to take out 20% of all their land out of circulation. Our scheme's slightly different under the New Elms scheme, but it's not overly different. So there'll be a percentage of land taken out to which we'll put some down to pretty flowers. Have you tried living on them? And some will go down to and the lays and things with the pretty flowers, and then we've got, we're gonna plant some trees. Okay, get rid of all the carbon dioxide that's in the air. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about that one for a minute, because I'm gonna cover that in depth later, one of the things that Rachel's here to talk about. Me, my passion is growing tomatoes inside polytunnels, right? That's my absolute passion. I grow 16 varieties of tomatoes and I love it. That's my big thing. Now, does anybody in the room know the answer to how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere? 
Yes. Oh, you got my tap. That's honest. That can't be right because that's what we all agree on. Everyone said the same figure, right? Okay, I have to take that out of my speech now. Damn. <laughs> the reason I asked the question is because I asked in a room full of farmers the other day, and one of the guys said to me, he said, I don't know, 10, 20 percent? People have no idea. They, they can quite happily argue with me over the facts, but then don't actually know what the answer is. So when you point it out and they go, no, that can't be right. Now, just to give you an idea, as a tomato grower, I let off carbon dioxide cylinders in the greenhouses to bring the level of carbon dioxide up to 20% sometime, and I still work in it. I ain't died. So there's this complete bank of nonsense, and I you know, talk about later is the three big things which in the farming side have, in my opinion, are, are what's kind of causing the challenges. But the myth behind the carbon dioxide and the um, net zero is at the root of everything what's going on. Banks are not lending money to farms on the grounds that they haven't got the right, you know, um, policies in place to deal with carbon dioxide or, you know, capture and all the nonsense what goes around it, right? I'm afraid we had a bit of a fail with the recording. It was way past my bedtime by the time I got on stage and I forgot to set up the camera for Karina to record. And then she did it on her own phone, which killed it. So we've only got a few minutes. You'll be relieved to know. But if you go back in time, we've had far higher levels. Um, sort of 550 million years ago, it was nearly 8,000 parts per million. And then you look at more research and we've actually had the lowest levels for 140 million years. So... When you look at it and look at how CO2 improves plant growth and all the other good things it does that no one ever mentions, um, it's difficult to really blame CO2 for all this warming, especially from human activity, because it's such a small amount. And why aren't people looking at the solar cycles, the oceanic cycles, Aishi albedo? There's so many things that affect temperature and so many things more powerful, more powerful forcing agent than CO2. So therefore, it is rather questionable. And when you look at the things like 97% of scientists agree that there is, you know, it's human caused global warming, it's like, no, they are agreeing, 97% agree there is global warming. And yes, there has been, no one denies the climate is changing. It has done forever. Um, but the only, when it comes down to it, less than 1% agree with the IPCC's version of events. And when you look at their computer modelling, they've been up to three times higher than the actual temperatures. And this has been going on for decades. They've not just got it wrong once. They, the more it goes on, you'd think you'd tweak your computer modelling so they would get more accurate. But if you look at it, it actually goes up even higher. So they're getting way out with the data. And then you look at all the other stats. It depends where you take the, the dates from. So, for example, all these heat waves and all this global boiling we're experiencing, if you look at a lot of the charts, they start from 1960. If they went back to 1920 and included the 40s, the chart actually goes the other way. Same with polar bears. There's so many now, they're getting to the point where they need to cull them. And then there's the melting ice sheets in Antarctica. Well, the BBC will tell you that, you know, it's a tremendous problem. And yes, it is on the western side, but the eastern side is gaining ice. So for global warming, that's a little, little peculiar that on one side of the Antarctica, there is melting, and on the other side is gaining ice. That doesn't sound very globally warming to me. But what they fail to mention so often is there's the most active volcanoes under the western side of Antarctica. I think possibly that has more to do with it melting than us in our cars and cow farts. Especially as methane, that's only in the atmosphere for 12 years. It gets recycled into the system. And it's, it is a lot more powerful than CO2 as a warming agent, undoubtedly. But you're looking at parts per billion rather than million. And there's reports that it, it, there's less cattle in the world now than there used to be. So, yeah, there, there's a lot to it. So what I would recommend people do is really research it. And there's organisations like co2coalition.org. That's a really good website because it shows you all of the charts that I've just mentioned. Uh, Tony Heller on YouTube has done My Gift to Climate Alarmists. It's a 12-minute video. He shows you how... Tony Heller... It shows you the start dates and how you can manipulate, you can get the chart to go any way you want with where you start it from. Um, and you can see that the heat waves and all these different things 
that we're being told about, how, how they are you know, completely the opposite when you look at the longer term data. Thank you.